thank you for coming to a very different Star Friend event. You're not used to this. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't go for like, welcome to Life on Mars. <laughs> I say podcast because I'm so used to that now. Let's see, everybody's here. Let's see if I can get all the, all everyone in the camera. I can get like a view, gallery view. All righty, yeah, that looks much better. I see some familiar faces. How are you doing? I mean, we got Victor, we got Lady, we got Bosky, we got, we got who else do we know from here? Great, some people joining. Let's allow for a couple of minutes so that more people can join the, um, can join the room. Uh, granted, we don't expect a huge amount of people because it's still, it's August. People are in holidays. I think we're all a little bit tired of online events. However, um, I think this could be a great occasion to help each other. We have devised this event because for those not familiar with Star Prime, what we used to do prior to the pandemic was uh, to host a monthly offline event where we interviewed famous entrepreneurs or investors from Barcelona and abroad. And uh, those events, typically in the first part of the event, we would have an open mic session. And what did we have in the open mic session? Everybody was allowed on stage for 30 seconds, to not, not to pitch their startup, but to ask for help, right? Actually, if you pitch your startup, we boo you, right? We boo your, uh, you in the event. That, that was really fun. It created a nice atmosphere. But the best part of the Star Grind open mic was that if you can actually help that person, I mean, we, you were not allowed to, to kind of like ask questions to the person on stage, but in the networking afterwards, you knew whom you talked, you needed to talk to. You had to talk to that person, that person, that person, because you could help them or you could be helped by them, right? Um, here, um, we're having our colleagues, Leide, Victor, Jan from our team from Starbrine Barcelona. Um, so what we're going to do here is that you will be using the raise hands uh, feature from Zoom. And we will give you about 30 seconds. Try to be mindful of everybody's minutes. Like we're not going to count to the second, but it's, you know, you will not be booed if you go 30 to 32 seconds. But if it's too long, we'll cut you off. And you will ask for help. You will not pitch your stuff. You can give some context like, oh, uh, we are a B2B um, accounting software startup based in Barcelona, raising our CSA. And we need help in this. We need help in looking for developers. We need, we need help with a good m a boutique, we need lawyers, we need this and that. Um, I think that's pretty much about it. I mean, we're still having some people joining. Um, for those unfamiliar with Startup Grind, uh, as I said, we used to do offline events. We had done 73 events prior to the pandemic. Then in the last 18 months, we've done about 30 something events online. We do that by connecting, inspiring, and educating entrepreneurs worldwide. And chances are that if we're not able to help you here, because I know that some people come from other chapters around the world. Um, so this is not exclusive to Barcelona, right? Even though, you know, we're, we're, this event is organized from Barcelona, we have people joining from all over the globe. So we can also try to help them. We can also try to help these people by connecting them to people in other chapters or in other regions. Uh, there's a lot of people who are expats in Barcelona. So you might be able to connect them to somebody in your local ecosystem, right? Or in your original ecosystem. Am I forgetting anything, Jan, Lady, Victor? Anything you might want to point out before we kick this off? All good? Oh, well, I think you got it all right. All righty. Let's see who wants to who wants to start because we got some that have been sent by email because some people are really shy <laughs> and they're like, I don't want to talk, but like I've got <laughs> I can send you. But maybe somebody from the audience wants to start. Uh, I don't. I don't recall where the raise hands option is because <laughs> I've been on holidays for a while now. Um, if can, somebody can point it out. Also, the chat should be allowed for everybody. So let's also use the chat if you're if you're muted because we will be unmuting you when you raise your hands. So if you're not unmuted or you just want to point something like really really fast, just use the chat. Right. Um, okay, who else? Okay, so maybe we want to start with somebody we know. I think that maybe our good friend, where are you? Where are you? Boski, you want to start with this? You want to start? You can. How Hello, can we help everybody? you? Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yeah. We can help okay, you. Okay. How can I, we um, help you? Uh, <clears throat> here. 
Uh, nice to meet you here. It's the first time that I, I come like a, this kind of event. Uh, and I, I am the founder of a B2B startup. And I would like to know your opinion about a B2B uh, growth marketing. I, I, am, I have many doubts. I don't know if it, it, if it is best to, to hire uh, some expert in this area or to collaborate with some agencies. Uh, we are in a proceed round, and I don't know. I, I am. I have many many doubts about that. I I, am, I have joined a, a group about growth marketing, but I I don't know what to do. If you can recommend me, uh, what would you do, or what you what about your experience? It would be very useful for me. That's a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you so to, much. Anyone wants to answer this? Maybe Jan, you've got quite a lot of experience in early stage. Maybe you want to go for your opinion. Ah, uh, you need to unmute. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were a co-host. Awesome. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I was actually talking with this with someone yesterday uh, because I think that B2B, I assume you refer to the B2B playbook, right? Or like what to do, how to consistently sell. Yeah. Okay. I think that really depends on the range and the pricing of, of your product. So that's the first thing. And there's not a solution for, for everything. But personally, for from my experience, B2B, if you are able to tap into companies that need your product, um, that's perfect because you are directly addressing their need. And in a way, if, if it has a reasonable pricing, they will directly put the money up front. But um, the hardest thing is always getting to that decision maker in, in that given company, right? So. Normally, I think most of the of the teams that do only B two B, they have like a, a force of sales that just takes care of getting to those contacts or getting a number of no's from a company to know okay, I, this company doesn't want to deal with us. And then it's about getting those companies that are more suitable, building up use cases or demos so that you can switch from kind of like a pull marketing to a to a push marketing, and that's more or less what I what I would go in in this case. I don't know if someone has uh, wants to chip in. Alex, uh, you work with a lot of a lot of companies that outsource you. Um, I don't know if that's what you're looking for. You're looking for more resources, but my my general advice would be I would do it myself rather than outsource it because it's very personal. Nobody can communicate your brand better than your own and the value that that you do. But it's useful to have sort of people knocking on doors so that you as the founder or as part of the, the team end up only doing the pitches to people that you know already can make the decision for the product that you are selling. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Ronan, I think that you you want to answer this or? You yeah, absolutely. Um, th thank you. Uh, so so I'm a recent arrival in, in Barcelona, um, but I've over Welcome. 15 years in, in B2B. I don't know anything about B2C, but B2B I know really well. And in my previous gig, I was chief revenue officer for a company exactly like yours, so pre-seed. And I can tell you from the mistakes we made and, and some of the successes, this is core competency. You got to own this yourself. And to, to Jan's point, you know, driving the inbound is really key, but it's going to take you time because that, that's content-based. So there's, there's a couple of shortcuts you can do. Um, the outbound is not pretty. It's not fun. But you know, to get some deals in the pipeline can work, and plus it's highly targeted. And to your question on agencies, I, I think it's okay. Um, you know, if it's just a shortcut for three, six months as you learn or as you get your team on board, okay. But you got to own this yourself. This is going to be your key to growth. That's good I'll, advice. I'll put my my email in the in the chat if you want to. Sure. sure. Thank, yeah. thank you. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to jump in and also share my, my, you know, because Jan, you, you pointed out that, uh, I also, I, I get a lot of pitches like this. Um, I'm also in the B2B space, right? And B2B, I think that it's better if you can do it yourself because you are relying more on trust. If you know what I mean, that your contracts are bigger, your, your, your interactions are fewer as well. So you will, it's not like B2C that you can actually have got like potential millions of people in the market. So if you don't fee, do things right, you know, doesn't quite work with an agency, you can work with another one, you can pivot, find the right message. If you're talking to fucking Casha Bank or something like that, where you're selling, uh, you might want to nail it on the first, uh, on the first attempt, right? So for me, at least I've always done 
marketing, B2B marketing, all myself. I've never outsourced. B2C, I have outsourced right from the get-go because I don't know and I don't want to know how Google ads and all of that works. So I've outsourced to some freelancers of trust. But B2B, like if it's, especially if it's it's uh, inbound, like blog, creation of events or crea creating content, SEO, whatnot, I've always done in the company, uh, which I think it's worked well for Mark Space. Mm, at least that's my opinion. Um, anyone else wants to chip in in, the, in these or shall we go for the next one? Shall we go for the next one? Anybody who wants to be wants to be next, raise your hands. I see a reaction that is not a hand. David, all right, there you go. It's going very fluid. Welcome. Hi. How can we help you. Hi. So I'm a new member. This is my first time here. Uh, I'm one of the founders of an alcoholic beverage company based off Barcelona, out of the new trend hard seltzer. Hopefully you've heard about it. It's called Flava, and we're in need of several things right now. We're basically in the traction stage and we need help with the distribution. So getting access to big distributors that can get us uh, running. Uh, but also in terms of hiring people, uh, we're in the part where we need generation of content, especially not, not so much in terms of pictures and, and stuff like that, but more like in the new era, in the new younger generations, which TikTok reels and all of that stuff. Uh, and then, of course, what you were just saying, Alex, I think the part of marketing, the Google Ads and the Facebook expert, I think that could go a long way for us. And we need, really need an expert that can nail down the Google Ads because we haven't been really successful with that. So any, any person that you have in mind would really be helpful. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to the community. I think, Victor, you're the most qualified person in the room to talk about that. We were talking about TikTok prior to <laughs> prior to the event and also distribution i seem to recall that you've got many contacts in the industry so maybe you want to answer this one well i'm not quite sure how to uh <laughs> how to answer it i thought you did, a, you did a fine job in terms of TikTok, i've been helping my daughter to to grow but that's really there's nothing more to it than what uh, alex had said before and wrote in as well um these are core competencies that you really have to nail down hard. I'm still going through it myself, um, but I, I've watched my, my daughter who works next to me at Barcelona Metropolitan. She started in February, she's up to a million uh, followers on TikTok, or almost a million now. She'll hit, she Ooh, should wow. surpass it this month. And it really is four hours every day, just dedicating, um, you know, Lots of video, a lot of work, segmenting the market, everything that she learned in school, but now it actually means something to her. Uh, before it was kind of, uh, uh, I guess, more uh, abstract. Uh, in terms of getting contacts, uh, there are actually a number of associations. I was thinking about it as you were, you were asking a question, David. Um, I I've, I've, I've strongly recommend going to Axio and talking to them about how they approach this. And I can take you offline it's a longer, the response is a bit long for this crowd here, but in terms of distribution and working with industrial companies, I think there's a lot better um, sources that I can point you to than to execute myself. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna give it some thought and I'll come back to you. Perfect, well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, the, oh yeah, there's another thing you wanna say? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, just quick question, how can I reach you, Victor, offline? Uh, okay, I'll put up my contacts here in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, I'm right, also perfect. sharing my my Thank LinkedIn, you. my LinkedIn on on the chat. That would be that would be useful. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Uh, let me before we go to what, who wants to go next? Because otherwise, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a couple of them because I think a couple of them are very I sufficiently generic that would apply to everybody who's gotten the email and sign up right away when I said I know how to hire developers, but. <laughs> Uh, but let's hear your, some of your questions uh, first. Uh, maybe wants to wants to go next, uh, Johnny. Yeah. So you you use your uh, the offline version of the race hands. <laughs> you have to use the yes, uh, because yes, I, don't so the no I don't I see everybody on the screen. No worries. I don't see everybody on the screen. I was checking it everywhere, but I could not find any option to raise hand in Zoom. I even googled it, but no button showing up where it should be. Okay, right. so. It's a My reaction. I think it's is, one reaction. Yeah, in reactions down in the right. I think it is. 
uh, just for everybody. That no worries. Is, that's what I couldn't find. Sorry. I learned All right, now. but uh, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So uh, I'm basically a solo founder of a an, an SaaS company, which is an online onboarding uh, tool. So it helps other web applications create and integrate onboarding for their platform. And basically I've been developing it. I'm a software developer in the last one and a half years now. And now I'm at the stage where I am really looking for early user feedback to see if it makes sense what I've been doing. And uh, yeah, I wrote an email also about it to Alex. And uh, yeah, if you guys have been through that, how did you get the first uh, users to try it? Not even customers really, it's just uh, to get feedback, whether it makes sense. I haven't done any B2C myself, so I'm happy to pass it on to somebody else who wants to answer that. I mean, I think Victor, Jan have got, uh, Bartolome has got, have got more experience than I do in B2C. So if any of you wants to answer this one, I'd be just, let me know who wants to answer this I, one. I can jump in. Yeah. Um, I think, well, my first question would be if you have any friends that are in the situation of that they're creating a product where your onboarding tool would be needed, like in the sense mm -hmm. of like, when I started doing B2C, I was building stuff for myself in a way. Like I was doing, mm. I was curious about entrepreneurship. So I was building stuff to help entrepreneurs. So it was very easy for me to find like four or five closest friends that had those very same needs and test it out with them. Uh, for, for what it seems, your product is very developer focused, right? You need to have someone that is building an idea that has done through the pain of, I don't know, integrating single sign on or um, creating a, a blur in a page to, to get to the onboarding and then go back to the app, right? So ideally you wanna yeah. capture them before they manually do it with React or any other painful process and kind of like put it in before. I don't know, like on the top of my head, uh, Hacker News could be a great place where you could like start posting maybe on Twitter's advanced search. Like you could, you could look through people that are uh, developing stuff and like you if you do advanced search you can actually define a lot of the keywords that you want to tap into or specific sentences where you know when mm -hmm. they say something relevant you just say hey uh i've done this onboarding tool and you know I'm, i'll give it out to you for free like i'm just looking for for beta testers or something like that also like if you create some scarcity like saying you know it's gonna cost money after but if you try it now um that that could work uh kind of like rolling the first beta users even if it's an alpha stage yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Peter, how are you doing it with Metropolitan? Well, I wanted to answer the question. But if, can you repeat exactly what it is you're looking for? So I'm looking for like early user feedback. So just to evaluate whether it makes sense for the clients, the UI, the flows, everything. Well, I guess um, when uh, I've been in the, I guess, mentoring of accelerators and uh, incubators. How, uh, how extensive have you done your, um, what do you call this, client development phase? Yeah, so I, it was, um, so I, I went through, like, I created some of, like, target audiences. Like, I have some ideas who might be the target, but I really was focusing on the development in the previous period so i didn't go deep into the sales i'm coming from a technical background so literally i'm reading all the business books and trying to figure out how to do this part of the of the startup but uh, yeah so i have some ideas who might be my target audience but mm, i didn't really reach out far besides um, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, mentioned to my friends who might be in situation where it's relevant. Well, what, what I've advised people to do, and I had to do it myself, it's actually quite painful, but it's, it's uh, extremely insightful, is mm -hmm. uh, doing focus groups and basically starting um, to develop a lot of contacts as fast as you can on LinkedIn. Uh, as And start to develop, segment them out into focus groups so that you can understand who you're I guess re a buyer persona would be, and make mm -hmm. sure that you're building something relatively quickly so you can go through iterations of it very quickly uh, and uh, iron out the bugs as fast as you can. But in terms of very early stage, you want to get a lot of uh, as many contacts that's going to be able to respond to you 
uh, when you send out interviews and, and the, we've done surveys, interviews, focus groups, because the faster you can get people to, to actually respond to you, the better you're going to be able to adjust the product. And there's no okay. real easy way around it, but to d develop a long list, cast a very large net and start whittling it down. The whittling down actually sometimes isn't so hard because you know you can expect a low percentage of people re uh, that are going to respond. But as uh, Jan was saying, if you have some people who you know that trust, uh, the better that level of, uh, I guess, trust and, and, and a warm intro that you have, the more insights they're gonna give you. Um, the difficult part is spending the time to suss all of that out. It sounds easy, it's not really a hard, it's, it's a simple process, difficult to execute because it's time consuming and um, there really is no way around it, but it's gonna be ensured that you're not creating a product that nobody, or that you don't have a big yeah. enough market uh, to purchase and to really help you with the product market fit. I'm still mm. going through it myself and I've been at it for a year and a half, so I understand how painful it is. <laughs> Uh, Johnny, okay, I have, I have a, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, when, when you mentioned onboarding, is it onboarding in terms of like you arrive at an app or employee onboarding when they just join the company? And I wonder. No, maybe, like, it's the, the first one. You arrive in an app, so it's like with pop-ups and tooltips navigating you through the app. Okay. So yeah, I guess maybe a, one other question I would say is I don't know if someone in the audience is currently building an app and is going through the pains of having to build four more screens <laughs> over Figma and then coding them manually or something like that, that could be a, a great fit. Oh, Throw it out there, uh, casting the net. One thing that I wanted Thanks. to say here is like the only, probably the only validation of it for B2C is when we started the startup brand events in Barcelona. But I want, I want to share how that actually, like a validation wouldn't have helped, right? Because I didn't have access to the to the target people that ended up being our target at Startup Brand. When we started Startup Brand Barcelona, we wanted to create a sort of like an English speaking event for entrepreneurs, it was a paid event and whatnot, but all the events were in Spanish, right? So if I had targeted English speaking people just by showing them what we had, it was just like a small event in Spanish, maybe I wouldn't have found the right people also uh, what we ended up having, because eventually we transitioned to doing uh, English only events, we've had a lot of expats coming, a lot of expats, right? I have never belonged to that community being a local myself, right? So I wouldn't have found them in the, in the first place. So I think that the, the, the best validation was to actually not validate and just do the event and just make it happen month after month. And, you know, word of mouth spread, ended up spreading and uh, just by being there for a sufficiently long time people found out about it so you know i think i don't know if that really helps or not but uh i want to say maybe if i had done some research i would have found something that people didn't need actually and i wouldn't have built it so you know lo and behold it turned out to be a, the extremely opposite case uh who wants to go next um for those who are joining now there's a reaction that's raise hands just uh, use that one because otherwise i will not be able okay baptist yeah there you go Hi everyone. Yeah, can you hear me? Good. Perfectly loud and clear. Cool. Um, so happy to be here. It's actually the first time I've been uh, in the Slack group for a few, yeah, some times already. Uh, but uh, first time I'm uh, attending to such um, an nice. event. And uh, I'm the founder of a six stage uh, B2B startup. We are targeting at uh, e commerce stores. And uh, so we this this is the typical uh, Shopify plugin and WordPress plugin. You know, you, you plug and play to a store. Um, and we have to deal, this is, so I have a very specific need. It, it regards watermark and backlinks. Um, we, have, um, we have a watermark for our freemium user on our products. And from this watermark, we, we get a decent amount of traffic on our website. Uh, but as you guys probably know, uh, e-commerce stores aren't very, they don't have a, a high domain rates, uh, right? There, there's a lot of dropshipping store and so Google don't classify them very well. So we have bad traffic coming to our, to our, store, to our website and the domain authority of our website is going down. So on, on the one hand, we have a lot of traffic coming from this watermark, but on the other hand, this traffic isn't very uh, qualified and well seen by Google. So just wanted to know if someone already dealt with uh, backlinks and how to filter them to make sure we only have uh, good backlinks coming to our websites. 
Sorry, it's very specific, but this is really the well, need we have at the moment. I, I know, like, when I have things like that, because some of my clients, you know, I run a software development agency, and we don't do that, but, like, a lot of our clients are like, hey, can, by the way, besides development, can you also help me with SEO, backlinking, and, and uh, integrity checking and whatnot? I use an agency or a couple of freelancers that are very good at that. I can send these contacts your way. If you send me an email, alex at marsbase.com, alex at startupbrand.com, send me an email with that specifically so that I can forward it to them. Um, but is there anybody in the audience who wants to answer that right now? Because I'd like to know the answer, actually. So that's, that's very complicated for me to understand. Raise your hands if somebody wants to answer that. I wonder, can you actually control the backlinks? Like, it's just random websites that are pointing to yours. Like, can you stop them from pointing there? Or would you have to, like, do manual strikes to take them down? Or I don't know. I'm just curious. I'm like, can you actually stop, like, bad publicity? Or not, not bad publicity, but... This this unfiltered links. I don't know if you have tried up this. I'm just wondering on, on this. Uh, we've, All right. Uh, sorry that you have to uh, unmute. Sorry that Baptiste was must muted again. <laughs> uh, I know you can control them. Uh, I know you can filter backlinks and uh, only uh, accept good quality backlinks. Let's say, but I don't know how to do and uh, and. Of course, I can uh, definitely go through an SEO expert or an agency. So, Alex, thank you. I will definitely email you regarding yeah. that. Uh, but yeah, that, that was basically my question. How to filter them and do you have any tips or do you know anything or any contacts? I, 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 I would be inclined. I assume you've used uh, Sorry, SEMrush? SEMrush. We use uh, Href. Href, yeah, it's the other one. Ah, okay. And that, that, I, I, I only use SEMrush. I assume Href is also going to give you a but an analytics of, uh, I guess, toxic links and so forth that you can then go out and, and uh, ameliorate? Yeah, 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 create a filter based on that. We have to dig a bit more into that. Thanks for that. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say one, one way to go about it could also be like thinking about the same email spam filters, right? Like you could think about uh, when you have a when you have a lot of emails that are spammy, like forty percent sale and so on, Google automatically filters them down. So you could, I guess, manually build this on yourself. Like if you are well versed in natural language processing, like you figure out, well, what's the key component of the website that comes from a bad backlink, and what's the key component of all the other websites, and you try to spot out. I don't know if it's individual works or the references of where that's coming from. Like I don't know, maybe um, a bad referral comes from. I don't know, Wallapop that is trying to sell like a Chinese copy of that same product or AliExpress where it's linking that. So you, you I, I think it's, it's about identifying where does the bad thing come from, right? Is it the domain? Is it the words inside the domain? Is it the fact that people are commenting and it's not done by an editor? Um, I guess I would go about it the same way you would create an, an spam filter. Cool. Thank you. And just the last thing, Bartolome, you, you wrote, uh, do you have any experience with Product Hunt? Uh, I did a launch a few months ago and I wrote an article about it on a friend's blog. So if you, if you want, I can drop it in the, in the, in the, in the chat. And you can reach out to me if you have any question. And thank you for, uh, for, your, uh, for, for uh, the answers, guys. guys. No worries. Bartolome, you want to say something or I think you're on mute? looking for the unmute uh, now. No, no, Alex, I, I, I didn't uh, listen to the, the last part of uh, Batis. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. But uh, then I can write you by, by message or I will, of course. OK, uh, there's one I want to read from somebody from the audience who's actually too shy to come on, <laughs> on the camera and everything. Her name is Maria. Huge shout out to Maria. She says that she uh, her request is that she's looking for a co-founder slash wine lover and an expert in growth hacking to join her team at the Wine In Wine subscription community made fun, sexy and unpretentious. It sounds like a sounds like a sponsor. I read it like a sponsor, but it's not. <laughs> but if you know any any people um, in the uh, like who love wine and they love either marketing or they are they could be a co-founder for a wine subscription uh, company. I think we could share. I mean, I don't. Pers I know a lot of people who are alcoholics, so perfect. That's why I'm saying, like, I, I could be a great, a great beta tester for the 
uh, for, uh, I think it was Baptiste. No, who said like you had, no the beat. He had a, like a, an alcoholic beverage, right? So let me know if you want me to test it. I'll be I'll be happy. <laughs> I can. Uh, I'm great. I'm great at uh, drinking. So, um, but I don't know. Like some tips for finding co-founders because that's out of the eight people who sent um, some emails asking for for staff or email. Um, the eight of them were. I need developers or I need co-founders. So maybe we want to dedicate five minutes, five, 10 minutes to talk about that, right? Um, very briefly, in my experience, uh, my co-founders are my two best friends from childhood. So um, I, I, it's not like that doesn't apply to a lot of people. But we, when we were using, as I, I share in the email today, when I send it out to Startup Grind, to the community, um, I've hired four people that I found doing the open mic in our event at Startup Grind. Right. Um, it came out. I think the point came across as if you do the open mic in Star Prime, it will be you will find developers. No, that was not the point. The point is that if you do this and you've got a sufficiently interesting company and a track record and some trust and you are well known and whatnot, you have more chances of attracting developers or a technical co-founder. Right. Some people just come to the event and they pitch once. And they do a really bad open mic pitch or whatever, or like uh, they're, you know, hey, we got this, the best company ever. You should, you're a developer, talk to me, because we need developers. That's not how you go about things, right? Uh, if you appear desperate, I think that's a bad, you're signaling a bad situation of your company, right? Um, I could talk at length, I could talk about, you know, about how to hire developers, what motivates them. I'm a developer myself. I know we have other developers in, in the room. Um, one motivates developers, but I think that the last thing you want is to oversell your company and, uh, and to over pitch it to developers. Cause that's not how you attract them. If you do your homework, there's a ton of things that you can do, right? You know, publishing your playbook or working on open source or having already developers in place or befriending developers and CTOs, owners of agencies, cause we hang out with developers. So maybe it's a longer route. But uh, I think those are three, four, five. I'm happy to elaborate further if you, mm, people want me to. But I want to hear other people, um, you know, sharing their experiences. I know somebody in the room who's an expert in hiring developers, and that is Bartolomé. So now it's your turn to share some tips about how to find developers or uh, technical co-founders, CTOs, because he runs a company precisely does that. So you can share one or two tips. It would be fantastic. Okay, Alex. Um, I, and I know, know I didn't ask you to prepare, but it's spontaneous. That's how it works. <laughs> yes, I, wa I was looking at an article that I shared the other day uh, on LinkedIn, and it was very helpful because it was written uh, by a developer. And I think that uh, the best here is the instruction is that uh, a developer as well as your question because I am not a developer. But uh, in our experience uh, now uh, with the COVID, the, the, the world is changing a lot. Uh, many companies from uh, USA, United Kingdom, France are hiring here in, in Spain, for example, or in Italy, uh, Portugal. And the competence is, is really, really hard here. And the best option, I think, is to to um, to write really good uh, job offers if you want that uh, more people apply. But uh, it's very important to be very um, I don't know uh, if it's okay the word in English transparent or I don't yeah. know the transparency mm -hmm. uh, with the salary. Uh, it's uh, very important to talk uh, about the project. Uh, if it's a remote, it will help a lot now because they are always choosing for the best option and and with remote uh, it's true that it's easier. And you can you can find developers uh, around different countries. No, I think you Alex can can talk about that. Uh, maybe in Mars based you are full remote and there is a, a really good option because in Madrid and in Barcelona the developers are more expensive than in, in the rest of the Spain. And this is a good point. But I think that it's very important to know uh, which are the, the salary range uh, uh, of, the, of the different kind of uh, software developers. No, uh, There are um, some good kind point. of te technologies that are, um, I don't know, 
for example, um, to find a mo mobile uh, developer, no, is really hard, and the salaries are growing up very fast. And I have to say that it changes depending on the countries, because, for example, uh, if you are looking for a Go developer in Spain, the community is very is very small, and the, the salaries are really high. And there are other countries which is with, which you can find a, a big community, and it depends uh, on the country too. But uh, I don't know if you if you have a, a, a specific question about that, I will I will try to answer about uh, our experience. Perfect, Jan. You want to wait in with something else? Yeah. No, I want to share a, a little anecdote um, because I, I am I was originally not um, technical, uh, and I think it 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 I actually learned how to code through through having to find a developer, right? So. We started a project. Uh, I, had, I had really good friends like Alex, uh, but maybe two friends, like um, the technical guy that was working on it got hired by, by Uber in San Francisco and another guy went on to Microsoft in, in Oxford. And I found myself with a project I still wanted to push and you know, no one to, to actually code for it. And I was sharing the, the, the pain of finding for someone technical with, with one of our friends uh, that was also could not find a CTO and we both decided to learn how to code and actually it's like okay like but if, if I learn how to code I'm not going to be at the level in which I want my product to be that's completely true but definitely speaking you know code knowing Python knowing a bit of what the technical requirements of what you have to do I think definitely helps out in terms of, of finding that person and I would also um, want to ask a question on top of that which I, I don't know the answer to but um, when you're hiring for developers, especially if you have a startup or a long-term project, you you maybe cannot compete in in salary so much as as you know some of those well-funded companies. How do you make sure that you're not hiring a, a mercenary? Like wh what is the type of I don't know what is the type of interview questions or how do you make sure that the person that is joining you is is in there for for the long run? That's a good question. Yes. Uh, Con Connor wants to wants to speak. I don't know if that's related to the point, the previous point, or to this one. Yeah, I, I can answer that question, but I can also answer the original question. So, go for both. Go for both. Then we'll back to uh, to Bartolome. So my name is Conan. I'm, I'm CTO at Picker, which is uh, a startup that's been going for about four years here in Barcelona. And I met my two co-founders on a website called Angel.co. So that's a website. Angel list. Yeah, yeah. Angel, exactly. Where that's where a lot of a lot of co-founders meet. And um, I think the people that you should be targeting, if you're an early stage startup that have you know revenue, free revenue, maybe even free speech, you're looking for people who have ambitions maybe to change their career. Maybe they are, uh, you know, a mercenary. They're working as a contractor. They're not super happy with it, and they have ambitions maybe to change from being a developer to becoming like a tech lead or go into a specific position, um, or have some sort sort of entrepreneurial tendencies, <coughs> which is me. Because <laughs> I was a pure contractor, I was on like the top of the salary range that you can make back like five years ago as an iOS contractor working with London companies and living in Besalú in Catalonia, of all places. And I met. Wow. Yeah, well, Besalu is the blockchain capital of Catalonia. I don't know if you guys know about that. No, you didn't know that. Didn't <laughs> it's, know where, that. it's where I ended up. But like, um, yeah, so I met my two co-founders through AngelList. We had the whole situation done within a month because we were two really you know, intelligent guys. I really liked their attitude. They were super entrepreneurial. And we got you know, we really done in, in, a month, in a month's time. And, you know, it, the rest is history for us. Um, there's that, and then there's also something else that I should point out. There is uh, I'm not a plug. I don't work with them, but I'm, I'm getting mentorship from them. Um, there's a there's a community of CTOs called Leader L I D Or, and that's starting here in Barcelona. It's training tech leads and uh, future CTOs. So those are great people to target as well because sometimes they don't have necessarily a lot of experience in a, in a leadership role or an entrepreneurial role. They're coming from being a pure developer and they want to sort of level up. And those people that are looking for a career change target especially if you have something like okay i like wine or i like music and it's like dealing with their, their skills and their hobbies outside of work and they can apply their technical expertise to that and especially being a mercenary how do you make sure you're not getting a mercenary that's a really good question um it's 100 percent down to, to chemistry you know and if someone's valuing salary above everything else it's going to be a bad deal and it's a question of like how how long are you guys willing to go together working, and you know for example without taking a salary that's a good scenario to run through. And read the book, the uh, founders' dilemmas. 
you know, it's free revenue for an extremely large and at the time, you have to be super passionate about what it is you're doing. So if you can fix someone who you know, has that mentality, of course, very difficult to find. <laughs> I'll admit that. But um, if you can find people like that, that's that's the type of person you can have a long-term relationship with. And, uh, All right. Bartolome, I cut you off before, so maybe you can go back uh, to, to don't this Don't worry, point. Alex. Uh, I think that Conan and another uh, developers can ask where better than me. Uh, I, I, I want to say that um, there is a big problem between the companies. Uh, because uh, more, more of the companies always are uh, looking for uh, five years of experience. And the most important thing is not the experience because you can find very, I don't know, junior developers that uh, uh, can work really well. And, and that's why I, I, I think that it's important to understand, uh, first of all, uh, the level of the, of the developer. No? Uh, the, and on the other hand, it's, it's true that it's very difficult to, to, to know uh, with uh, people if it's a mercenary, but it's true that uh, during the interview, uh, the recruiter can, can, can do uh, some uh, specific questions about that, uh, and, and can ask about the, the experience and about there is always like a feeling and, and can, can, can imagine no, if, if the, the, pro, the profile of the person can fit in a in a startup company or maybe in a in a big corporate, no? Depending of the of the personality, but um, th there is not a magic formula for for that. I, I have seen uh, in many colors, ma many different colors. Uh, you can find uh, in many many situations. I mean, for me, for instance, one thing I wanted to weigh in here because uh, you know um, we hire a lot of developers. Even though I'm not super involved in the hiring process, I get asked a lot by my friends who want to maybe work for for us in Marspace, right? And I try to downplay the company as much as I can because most companies out there they will be running their hiring processes through HR people who actually don't know that much about the technology and they would be like yeah you will be you will be working these shiny things the best frameworks changing the world and they're overselling the company so what i do is like i downsell the company like i undersell it and i say like you know it's pretty bo like i wouldn't say it's pretty boring but i would say like you know this is an agency sometimes you work in really cool projects and you will be working for you know top tier la liga clubs or for hp or other corporates or for some growth uh, scale ups Sometimes you will be maintaining old software and that can be, you know, uh, upgrading a Rails 2.1 as a Ruby 2.1 to Ruby 2.4 um, uh, application of a monolith that has been around for 13 years. And that could be your job. Or maybe you will be uh, maintain or evolving a platform, decoupling a, plat a platform that was bespoke software that has got no support anymore and we need to take it apart piece by piece and substituting so i go to very specific details about how your day-to-day -day is because i think that i as a developer would have valued that when i was interviewing for other companies they told me you know, like oh we work you know we do the best stuff for the biggest companies and then you go there all you do is get data from the database send data to the database that's all you do and fix you know ux ui um uh, stupid bugs on fucking firefox whatever or internet explorer 6 back in the day right if they had told me that maybe that would have interested me right uh maybe not so i try to be as precise as possible uh by saying how your day today could be in the best and in the worst case scenario so you can you know you can juggle it out and 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 try to understand it because then you will see that if if it's somebody who wants to be working on bleeding edge technologies working on be like having an impact from day one working with these are like huge teams with a you know uh also showing the team structure is very very important because a lot of people want to work only using you know shopify fucking squads or the organization that spotify used to have back in the day things like that or they want to have like a team of 10 people always because they want to be working with product that's not the case in our company most of the times you will be working with one person maybe you will be the solo developer in the project maybe you only work with a team of 10 developers of the client, but not ours. So I try to be as transparent as possible. And that that helps a lot because maybe we're burning a lot of people out that they just uh, they're not interested in this. But those who are really are because they appreciate the honesty. So um, that's how I think we weed out the possible mer mercenaries. Uh, but also, yeah, I like the point of the transparency and showing salary ranges. I think that's essential.
So, and be able to justify why you pay those salaries. Why are you above the market? Why are you below the market? Why are you on the market? Also, it's, you need to have an answer for that question because some people will be like, oh, why all the companies pay me more? Why should I come here? So maybe you've got better perks. Maybe you've got, uh, you don't do extra hours. Maybe you work with uh, core contributors to the technology you're working on. And that's, that's really fucking interesting. Uh, but I don't want to dwell too much on, on development stuff. What else, what, what other requests have we got here? Um, who wants to go next? Raise your hands, use reactions, uh, raise hands over here. Some people who haven't spoken yet. I mean, we got Adi, we got Alfredo, we got JM, we got Johnny, we got Rebecca. How are you doing, Rebecca? Good to see you. You want to ask something from the community? Yes, no? Not if you, if you want. Yeah, that's a yes. You open your mouth, so you, that's a yes. Go ahead. What you want to ask for? I, I was actually listening very actively. I'm a startup founder here in Barcelona, Mataró, actually. So I'm 30 kilometers away. Um, um, and we are looking for a CTO and attracting this fair CTO because we have been working with a remote team, um, kind of an external company. And now we are in the challenge of acquiring uh, a CTO into the company. And it's been very challenging. And I was listening to what you were saying. Sorry that I missed some part of the meeting. I was engaged in a, in a meeting earlier. Um, of being truly very honest because that, that's what I found. I put off some uh, CTOs thinking that they would be working with rocking technologies. And I said, no, no, you know, the next six months I need this, you know, to just be indexed at Google and find me as much people as, as, as it possibly can be. And then it's like they want to be super nice things and maybe we don't have that kind. Uh, we are not ready for that. So for now I'm, I'm, I'm listening, but just, you know, dropping this ball that I'm looking for, for a CTO in this fintech uh, we are working at Inviertis. Yeah, so maybe I can explain you um, a bit more later. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And that's something I really wanted to talk about, which is the thing about how to sell. I wouldn't call it unsexy technologies, right? But I was like, not bleeding edge technologies, right? As you pointed out, you, you were working with an agency, now you want a, a CTO, but maybe that CTO wouldn't have chosen those technologies, right? Uh, we work with a lot of clients whose technology is outdated and they can't find developers because they don't want to work on that shit and we have to work with that. So I have to convince my developers to do that. Um, so I think it's there's people for everything. And as I said, for me, it's the it's being um, being as honest as possible and saying like this is how it will work. Of course, that there needs to be some space. One thing that you can do, for instance, in, in your case, is like allowing for growth in the sense that tell them your job is not 100% this, like, or 100% of your job is not this. It's like, this is 90% of, job, uh, of your job, 10% of your job. You can do some other stuff. You like speaking at conference, you can do that. Contribute to open source. You can pioneer new technologies. You can develop, like, you know, maybe you want to work on prototyping a new version of the app using a new technology. That's something that you can offer. That needs to be on the table because you, you will have to negotiate a lot. So most of the times, and I would say like 90% of the times, negotiations with co-founders and CTOs don't boil down to the money. They boil down to the project, right? So whatever other things, other cards you've got on the table, because the money is relatively easy to find nowadays, but what other things can you put on the table? Perks, holidays, personal projects, trainings, uh, personal growth, whatever. What other things, equity, what other things can you offer them uh, to, you know, to bring this to the table and, uh, and secure them as co-founders or CTOs. That's a, that was a really good question. Anyone wants to weigh in on this? Cause, uh, I've got the feeling I'm talking too much. <laughs> yeah. Conan, you want to go again? Uh, let me see you. Where are you? There you go. Hey, hey Rebecca. Um, one of our, yeah, one of the guys in our company is from at the own, like this, there's, there's a lot of people out there who are super technical. There's a lot of people out there as well who would love to like you know avail of like remote work and then of course you have all of spain and europe as well open to you well my suggestion for you would be like when people say they want a cto it's like do you really want a cto or do you want like you know a tech lead or a developer who could maybe grow into a role in a cto good point <clears throat> good point because i mean if it's if, if the task that you have for this person right now is like okay we need better seo we need better indexing on google we need some you know stuff done on react you might get a full stack dev 
and offer like stock options or phantom shares or something like this. And then, like, like you were saying, Alex, like let them grow into that role. You know what I mean? With trainings and stuff like this that are, you know, if they if if that's what they want, you know. But if you feel that you're missing someone at the table with like long term strategy, decision making, direction of the company, and you're like, we need a technical person to come in and help us shape this vision. Sure, that's like a CTO for me. But what you described so far seems like, I mean. And get a talented dev to come in and help you and maybe offer some equity and say, hey, like, we're based on the road. You can work where, wherever. It's super attractive right now. The market's really good right now, in my opinion. It's a good point. Uh, oh, sorry. I think, Erica, you wanted to say something else. Go ahead. No, uh, actually, this is uh, 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 a decision that has been taken after, after thinking thoroughly through it. Uh, we need a CTO because uh, maybe... It's, Maybe you don't know, who knows? But there's a moment in a startup life that you actually need a CTO. And maybe, I think I have managed, kind of, but there's a moment in the growth of the company where investors won't take me any more seriously if I don't have a technical leader. This is something that it must be taken in consideration. Although I have been able, you know, kind of, um, um, manage without that. But it's true that what we're looking is a full stack developer um, able to step into a CTO position at some moment. Right now, we need someone that maybe yeah, takes 70%, uh, 80% of his or her time developing, and then some other time also taking uh, more uh, uh, architecture or technical decisions because I've been product manager i mean technical lead i mean too many things and i need to 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 focus on my work um uh, we are offering equity already but some other ideas have been rising and i think they um apart from from promotion and all these kind of things uh, good ideas are being aroused here thank you anything we can help you with conan since i don't know You've been offering <laughs> Uh, answers. Oh, you're still mute. Sorry. Yep. And yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, we're. I mean, obviously, we're hiring. I won't. I won't go down that road. I think we're. We're pretty happy with you know the way we're hiring. So we're going to grow there. And I, I mean, we're in a similar sort of space to the, to the person that was talking about Shopify a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. I mean, I have a question. I hope it's not too technical. <laughs> um, yeah. Basically, we're in a situation where. One of the big things that we're doing right now is um, we're doing a huge amount of data mining uh, off the internet, uh, but mostly e-commerce. And there was a company here in Barcelona that um, I think it's closed now, but you guys might know 21 Buttons. And yep. Yeah. So 21 Buttons uh, built a very big, uh, I, I believe, they built a very big data mining team in-house, which costs a lot of money, uh, just know from the rough salary ranges and the size of the team. And we're facing a decision right now with our runway and so on and so forth. Do we want to outsource this or do we want to bring this team in-house? Because currently um, we don't have any data profiles in the company, but we're, like, we're almost a data company in, in many ways, you know? So, yeah, I mean, if anyone has any experience with that, outsourcing data engineering, data science, and, uh, you know, to, to, to put it uh, external or to try to bring it in-house, because as we know, like data science is such a hot area right now. And they're like, they're such a premium on the salaries. And like, I mean, you can hire someone to be, to be to build a data science team and it's a cost of two developers, you know, and not to mention all of the profiles and data science, is not data science, data science is data engineering, uh, data analysis and uh, machine learning engineering. And, and then this data science spreads out into like, you know, NLC, NLP, um, you know, computer vision, so on and so forth. So. I mean, if there's anyone here who happens to know anything about that, I, I'd, I'd be all ears. Alex, Alex is, is ambushing me. Uh, so um, <laughs> right right now, I'm a, I'm a data scientist for for Modlyful, so full.com. Um, and and I think that that's uh, and in the past, I actually found a nonprofit that is called Saturdays.ai that teaches people um, data science, and I did it again for for another bootcamp. And I think, like you were saying, it, it's kind of hot area. Um, I, I want to look back to your original question, right? Where you're, you're I think the main problem you're having, or I want to stand that, uh, I want to split it into pieces, right? So you mentioned you have a problem with data mining, or that's that's the area that you're tackling now. And I guess my first question on that would be like, how hard is it 
for you to to mine this data in the sense of like um is it something that someone on fiverr for 10 25 bucks could do or is it something that you have to bypass a couple of logins you need like selenium something that essentially gets deep into copying these or the key things from amazon or some pages that are actively trying to not let you get their data so your question reveals to me that you know a little bit about this area <laughs> <laughs> slightly that's what i was pushing Kuhn. that's yeah. exactly so, why i was pushing um, it. to be honest what what's kind of happened and this this could all actually go back to product but like we've based we've basically set up a system that can uh you can add a product recommendation for any product on any e-commerce on the internet and the quality of the data that we, we mine varies greatly. So, for example, in the case of Amazon, we have a full API, everything right down to like product taxonomy, uh, versus like an e commerce, um, uh, Platino Malone, for example, in Barcelona, which is like a, is a big seller for us. But like the information that we get back from that is not so big. So, then that comes into a sort of a thing where it's like, well, what's the standard of the document that we want to get from this page? And then and, you know, how, how do we want to process that in our ML ops in terms of like setting a product taxonomy, and bearing tags and all sorts of stuff. And I mean, yeah, you, you could go, um, but I, I won't change the subject, but that, that's more or less the problem, the problem space. It's like, um, we, we can like, our, our app will get a full HTML page reliably. So I think what you're asking is, have you got any proxy issues? Have you got any issues with getting like 503s from spamming these sites? The answer is no. It's just we have the full product detail page because it's uploaded by our mobile application. And then it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how to scale that arm of the business because, like I said, I, I'm the CTO and I come from actually originally from mobile development. But data, I have no pedigree whatsoever. So, um, yeah, it's an unknown for us. That's why we're trying to build that, uh, that data side of the business. I, I think it's, um, it's really interesting uh, because now that I that I work at a big company and I, I thought, oh, okay, like they, they have this figured out. The answer is also no, right? So like, yeah, it, it, like data <laughs> quality is is a big issue across our companies because, you know, if you started collecting data at a certain year or, you know, in whichever way you had, you have X years or X months of data and you have to do something from nowadays or you have to figure out the process for tomorrow. So it's actually a really, really challenging um, process. Um, one piece of advice is data scientists normally do not know how to solve that. Like they're more, um, they're more on the statistics part or they're more like, Hey, give me the Jupyter notebook and I'll be able to produce a model for you. Right. That that's traditionally what a data scientist does and data engineers are actually the type of guys that are in love with, let's say AWS uh, tool stack. And then they will be like, no, I want to, I want this. You know, if they see a five, you, you can't, you ideally want to find a guy that if he sees like a, you know, five page query of SQL gets like, gets like an ugly face and is obsessed with improving it. And and I, I know someone because I, I hired him, but um, he also tells me like how many offers he's getting from, from companies like with, again, insane salary offers and, and so on. So in a way, I, I would say it's probably the hottest area from data itself, which is already hot. Uh, a couple of recommendations here is if you can get someone that is like, if, if it's really hard for you to find that data engineer or that person that's kind of like the head of data that maintains the quality across all the different platforms and kind of ensures that it's something that you can later do ML ops or, you know, apply the models and so on. Um, it's not so unreasonable to train them. And, and I know that because this person didn't know anything a year ago. Like he went through, through a bootcamp that we taught him worked really, really hard into learning this. And I was essentially, you know, leading this process, but, you know, it, it, it could actually be about you getting, like identifying someone that has this ability or wants to go in this direction and saying, okay, like we'll invest some months or some, some part of your hours in, into you learning this and then them figuring out how to do this. I think it's something that everyone is figuring out on the go. So anyone that claims to be a data expert maximum has two or three years of experience. So it's, it's both good and bad because no one is an expert, but also, um, yeah, people can be created from, from relatively a uh, small period of time. One thing I wanted to do, uh, to point out here, another company you might be able to learn from is the case of Billings, right? Is the AI company, AI slash ML company that was acquired by Apple. So um, they, why I, I, I know this because basically yeah, shameless plug today on the Mars Days podcast, we released the, the interview with their, their, their CTO and co-founder and they were talking about how they built their uh, machine learning slash AI uh, engineers team in Barcelona. 
Uh, and the interview was like from three years ago, but it's still valid. Like I was listening, I was like, wow, this is still fucking valid because they were saying how competitive the market is, how people have little to no experience in this and they sell themselves as experts and how to attract them from even from other cities to Barcelona. So you might want to dig a little bit into the air story because it's a, you know, it's a success case of a company that eventually got acquired by Apple and how a lot of these companies, they're just so purely because of the of the engineering team, right? And not because of the business so much. It's just like, yeah, we really wanted a team of, of 45 uh, data engineers and we couldn't find it elsewhere. So, you know, uh, that's one of the main reasons why Apple acquired this, this business. Um, so what else? Oh yeah, thank you, Lady, for plugging that in. Um, sorry, I think I cut you off, Conan. Yeah, I'll definitely check out that podcast. I mean, um, I, I guess for us, just the decision right now is whether or not to outsource it or to try to build it, build it in-house. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to check I, that out. Yeah. I wouldn't outsource it in the sense that data is a central part of the organization. Like if you have an outside, like if you have an outside consultant come in and tell you how your data is going to be organized, like I feel like the problem is that they don't have, they are not going to be there long enough to feel the impact of that decision, right? Like in a way, you can pay them good money and it can come out to you cheap, but you will know two years from now. And if they're in the company, at least you can all know, hold them accountable and get them to, to fix it. So hopefully they, they build it the right way. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the answers. No worries. What else? Have we got anybody else? Because I still got a couple, like some, some others they can, I can read. Um, but let me know if somebody else has got any other question regarding... Uh, Lawyers, office space, funding. Um, what else? What else do people care about these days? Uh, normally, it's development. Normally, it's development and technical co-founders. That's all. Okay, we got somebody else. Victor, there you go. How can we help you? Where well, you? I had a question regarding how do people handle um, registering their intellectual property? Uh, I know that um, I have some friends that are doing a lot of... Uh, monetization of IP and perhaps even uh, providing investment based on patents and registrations, trademarks and all that stuff. But uh, I seem to hear often that um, a big mistake in Spain with developers is that, or the companies, that they have not taken the time to properly research uh, the names and the products for patents and, and uh, trademarks. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if this is something that uh, is near and dear to the hearts of this group of entrepreneurs. Not me. <laughs> Who wants to go? Who wants to go? Who wants to answer this? Because um, like literally we registered the Mars based Mar uh, trademark like a week ago. <laughs> so. All right. Is, has anybody had any experience in, in registering a trademark or a patent or a copyright uh, or faced cyber squatting? Wow. Uh, no, I see a lot of no's. Oh, yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, okay. Go I mean, um, obviously, when we started uh, working with Invest in VRTs, our company, um, we registered the trademark not only in Spain, but also in Europe. And this doesn't mean that we haven't had some kind of problems related to, to the how do you say in uh, to the website because we're using dot s instead of dot com because someone purchased and and there we got it now um more because of uh, accountancy things what we're doing is registering the intellectual property of all the development we've done and it's not a uh, uh, an easy buy because our developers are in argentina so what we had to do was taken um, before uh, in front of a public notary, they have to sign that everything they have developed and written in code, it's, uh, it's in VRT's ownership. And then we had to bring it here in Spain, take it to another public notary. And finally, we have taken to the um, um, property register um, bureau um, so that um, but this, this, so that we can register this intellectual property. This is because, um, how can I say? Because this intellectual property has a value. It's an asset in your power. 
And in terms of accountancy, when, for example, you have to ask for a grant or, or a subvention or anything that goes in this direction, uh, you need to kind of justify what you've been doing with the money. In terms of protection, this is a different, a different song, and it's probably more difficult because then it's when you're getting into patterns, usability patterns, and these kinds of things are a bit more difficult. So we've been registering the, the intellectual property of, of, our, of our code, let's say, but more because of accountancy, uh, tax um, objectives, let's say. Uh, if you do this in Spain, it's pretty easy. You only have to take the code in a flash and take it to the register office. And I think it's a 50 euros process, not, not very complicated. I have an email with all the instructions if anyone needs. Okay. Well, thanks. I understand that the EU uh, Intellectual Property Office in uh, Brussels is offering, for those of people who are interested, um, they're offering a 50% discount during September for people who would like to register their trademarks. And I believe there's also a number of subsidies or loans or grants that are being offered to, uh, to companies. And so if people are interested, uh, I'm gonna look, sit in, in a webinar. I don't know that much about it, but I do know a lot of companies have not adequately protected their trademarks. I was wondering if this group had any bad experiences or good experiences. So uh, thank you, Rebecca. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a refund because we paid for I think it was not that much I think it's 600 euros uh, to to do the trademark in Europe something like that and we paid it last month <laughs> so thank you Victor for <laughs> sharing this <laughs> um, Jan I think you wanted to ask for something before sure I go to sure the next one um, I can I, I can do an you. ask if you if allow me to shut up um, so let me let me show you where where I'm working at it's it's full full dot com um, look at that. And we really need a, a, UI, a UI designer, as you can, as you can see, right? But let yeah. me pitch it like the, the value of the company, even if the product looks um, like it was done some years ago. If you had invested 10,000 years on, on Motley Fool, um, it, it's the fund that has overperformed SP500 for like a bunch of time. Uh, so yeah, if you had invested 10,000 years like 20 years ago, you would now have like, well, 300K, which is a pretty insane amount. Um, but long story short, we need kind of like the unicorn UI designer that can code. So someone that knows um, design and front end because we're part of a fast prototyping team. It's fully remote. Um, we pay uh, really, really good salaries and we try to have as little meetings as possible. So if you are that UI magical designer with coding wings or you know someone that is, that is interested in this remote lifestyle that Alex has been pitching since 2012, um, I would be very, very keen on speaking with him or her. Wow, that's a pretty difficult one. That's a, that's a very difficult one because usually if you're good on coding, you're not that great at designing and the other way around, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a unicorn. It's actually a unicorn. Um, now let me know. I mean, yeah, and, and obviously everybody wants to hire these kind of people, right? So you know it's not something that you might want, you might not want to outsource but uh there are some really good agencies out there that could help you with that but i don't know uh boski you want you maybe you had something to to share here or not really yeah all right yeah let's see if you can bring something to the table huh. um no not not really john uh, i it's, it's very important that uh, you offer full remote and a really good salary uh, and I will try to look for in, uh, in some communities, maybe in a Slack groups or something like that. It can be very useful uh, in contacts. And, and another thing that I will do is to contact people through LinkedIn in, in a really good companies that you know that there are, uh, that you can find these kind of profiles. Because in Barcelona, for example, um, when, when we uh, are looking for talent, we know in which companies are uh, the strongest profiles depending on the different areas and in Barcelona you, you can find some companies that are really good profiles but it's true that um, it's, it's not easy to to find somebody who, who knows uh, both parts and, and normally there is a one one part um, stronger than the other one 
but yeah. uh, if we can help you with some recommendation, uh, I, I will think about that. I, I will. I have to write uh, a note, and I will share it tomorrow with the team. If they they think maybe in somebody, I will. I will tell you. That'd be awesome. And I, I guess a follow up question on this would be: What are the standards of design or good design in terms of of Barcelona um, that that you all like or, or follow? I don't know if you want to type it on on the chat or, or just mention it. Um, I'm interested in, in seeing what you consider yeah. good design. Yeah, no, I, I am not a, a recruiter and, and I, I really, maybe I'm somebody of my group uh, may, or, or maybe there are people here that can, can know better than me the salaries, but I can share you here a, a picture of uh, our notion where we are always uh, putting the salaries uh, during different kind of months. Uh, you can see more or less the the rent salary of these kind of profiles in Spain, more, more or less. But uh, I, maybe I am not the best uh, person to answer the question. Okay, can I have a, say something? Yeah, sure. It's for the previous question, really, is that uh, I'm also trying to do the designs myself as a coder. And I think that uh, I mostly get my inspiration on Behance. I don't know if you know that website. It's a fantastic page. I think it's owned by Adobe now. Uh, basically, it's an online portfolio for most of the the UI designers who, who you can either hire or I think many of those people who put out their work there, they are also coding. Most of them are just designers, but I think you can really look uh, for someone who does fantastic uh, UI layouts and many of them can also code. A good point all right um let's wrap it up with the last one i mean uh unless somebody else has got because we got one from the audience and it's from somebody who wants to remain anonymous because <laughs> maybe the the, the the person in the company she's negotiating with um might be in the room i don't know that's the reason um anyway so there's somebody who wants to join a, a SaaS tech startup as a co-founder it's uh with regards to the compensation and equity right so so basically, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because it's a pretty specific thing, but it's basically the startup has been running for four years and this person in particular, this anonymous person, uh, will join as the head of growth slash revenue officer. So asking what kind of equity package would be, uh, would be ideal or how, you know, what kind of compensation can she aspire to? right uh, in order not only salary but also in equity considering that the company has got two co-founders and it's four years old already i literally have got no idea in equity distribution because uh you know i share only my company with my two co-founders and we're 33 percent split so uh i don't know if somebody can wait in on that how to negotiate with you know equity and startups have been running for several years who wants to go here Otherwise, otherwise um, Alex. Else. Yeah, go ahead, Victor. Um, the guy from Couch Surfing. Remind me his name. Yeah, uh, Casey. Casey Fenton. Yeah, I, I interviewed him uh, two weeks ago. Nice. Uh, he's actually come out with his new product, and it specifically has uh, it's to deal with this issue. Um, Abs absent, I'm happy to right? put them in contact. I cannot speak intelligently on how you know equity distribution or negotiations for this, such a thing. But um, I believe he can, and he has a new product that tries to help uh, companies uh, offer equity distributions to their employees, uh, as well as um, dealing with, uh, I think, multi-jurisdictional uh, solutions. So you don't have to worry about phantom shares in Spain and, and all this stuff. I, I, I'm happy to, if somebody wants to get in touch with me, I'm, I'm more than happy to put him in touch with Casey. Um, it's uh, United upstock, Steve. right? Upstock. Yep. All right. He, so, so the company's still alive because he doesn't report to investors and I'm an investor there. So that's good to know that the company is still oh, okay. doing well. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, yeah, that, that's I mean, that's that's an issue. But how would you do it? Your, I mean, you probably have got a lot of experience in that as an investor and as a serial entrepreneur, Victor. So how would you go about this kind of, you know, without having to use AppStock? Well, I'm kind of I'm, I'm in the same boat as you, uh, Alex. I have uh, my shareholder agreements with my partners and they've been close friends forever. So I haven't really had to distribute 
any new shares coming into to teams. We allocate basically on uh, you eat you get you eat what you kill basis. Um, yeah. And everybody, it's it's kind of the danger. I think it has uh, been a little bit scary for people to come on board. Um, and so I can see where that, that that's a challenge. But when we've been able to close a deal, they realize that we actually pay them first. And you know, they, they, um, when it's been extremely uh, what do you call uh, lucrative, that that fear goes away. But in terms of negotiating up front, I I'm not really sure I'm a good source to help advise on that. All right, all right, um, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, give a big, big warm welcome to our friend Francisco from overseas. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up, the, 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 this man literally scaled Startup Grind. He was the head of community at Startup Grind. He scaled it from two chapters to like 300, 400, something like that. And he's working now on Notion. Um, well, I, I'm super surprised about this surprise visit. So Francisco, maybe you wanna you wanna give a quick shout out. How can how can we help you? We're doing an open mic party in which everybody gets a chance to ask for help from the community. Hello. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the amazing welcome. Um, I just I really wanted so to, see to see Alex you. and see if you really shaved his head or not, and it looks like it's true. So, um, <laughs> but it's so so great to see everybody. I am so impressed by how large of a group this is here. Um, but in terms of of how I how you can all can help me. You know, right now I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty okay. I'm not at a startup or as small of a startup as I used to be, so things are going pretty pretty stable. But what I can do is, um, if anyone uses Notion and you can prove it to me, I can send you a box of swag. So I have little boxes of uh, of like stickers and everything else. Um, uh, so if I'm gonna drop my contact information um, in the link below in the chat, but um, I would love to send anyone who's a fan of, of Notion um, a little goodie bag. I, I sent out a bunch earlier this morning. Um, and Alex, I am just, I'm so impressed with what you've done. I'm so impressed with how Mars, you know, base is coming along. Um, and uh, it's been incredible to see you kind of run the chapter into one of the best in the world. And I remember when you first came and first uh, applied and it's been absolutely amazing. But if anyone needs any help with community, if anyone needs any help with any of those sort of things, I'm here to help. Um, I'm here to uh, uh, help the best I can. So, uh, well, uh, thank you for the words. I mean, to give some context, Francisco interviewed me uh, to, to get the chapter director position at Startup Grind. So he is directly responsible for me being here and for a chapter in Barcelona. And so super helpful for that, uh, being incredibly talented over the years. Uh, anything you might want to know about community, I like he's literally the person to talk to. Um, mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, how, besides that, how else can we help Notion? Because like, I, you know, we all use Notion. I know Bartolome, is, uh, he uses Notion because he reports to the investors using Notion. And that's how I got to use oh, Notion. Cool. But like, we use Notion for everything. But I, th I think awesome. everybody here in the room uses Notion. But what are you guys looking for? Uh, are you hiring? Are you, you know, obviously? Yeah. Um, so what am I looking for? Okay, here's what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for right now is um, how... When you first started no using Notion, what what tools or what helped you best use it? So right now we're having this issue where like um, folks jump on a Notion, they see the really cool like snapshots or screenshots on the internet, and they join and it's so overwhelming, right? Because it is like getting Legos, right? We, we kind of always say it's like a Lego block. So it's cool to see those cool like, you know, spaceships, Star Wars spaceships, but then you get a big box of just Legos and you're like, I don't even know where to start. So I'm curious, what were some of maybe the pain points you had when you first started using Notion? just because I'm literally working on like documentation and making sure that we make it as like easily accessible as possible. So any, any pain points that you'll encounter when you were first starting or any resources that helped you kind of get up and going, I'd love to hear about. Who wants to go first? Um, I, I know a couple of really hardcore Notion users here, so. Cool. Bartolome, maybe you want to share something? Dan, you want to share something about Notion? I'm muting you all. Yeah, let's see if I can, I mean. Numbers. Then you complain that I speak too much. No, I was just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, you, took, um, you took it personally. You took it personally then? All right, all right. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, it was very intuitive, like the, the blog idea. Uh, for me, the biggest pain was once I realized, okay, I kind of want to commit to this system, then how do I migrate everything over, right? I and I started like I... I, I, I got like a crazy idea of my head. I was like, oh, I want to put my bookmarks in, in Notion. 
I think I spent like a whole Saturday, like just okay, you import the HTML and then you put it there, but then I wanted to make it pretty and you you get you get obsessed with it. So like once you make the commitment to migrate the system, um uh, well now I'm gonna say okay, once I made the commitment to migrate the system, porting into Notion was was I would say kind of painful. And then <laughs> I wanted to try to run research and they had built like a perfect tool to plug into Notion and they're like, get your notion and put it here. And I was like, I, I didn't end up not using Rome, but I was like, okay, mm -hmm. that that is much less frictionless. Like, I don't think it's so much about the tool, but how do people keep information and how they're going to keep it under this new framework? Um, at least mm -hmm. the, the pain for me. I want to make sure I don't lose anything in, in the migration process. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've heard that our Evernote uh, migration isn't the best right now, especially I heard people having some issues. So engineers are looking into that now. And then I'm curious, when you were doing the importation, was this before or after the, the beta API was released? Well, I think it was a long time long ago, time so I, I, okay. I, I assume before um, it okay. was like, um, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was a while ago. I, I think it was, I, I, yeah, manually, I think I manually moved uh, everything. I, I'm pretty sure I copied, uh, I, I think there was some some idea to import an HTML and I, I migrated some bookmarks that I had that I thought was going to mm -hmm. be useful in Notion that honestly I have never touched and I killed them a couple of weekends ago because that, that was a silly idea of where to give them a Notion, but um, I, I really like the templates. Like, I think the templates yeah, fulfill that portion, right? Like, uh, so a lot of the times I'm like, wow, a lot of people have put great effort and great time on, on this notion. I'm just going to mm -hmm. copy it and I'm going to be lazy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm even willing to pay for some extra, like, I don't know, someone sold like a freelancing template, like how to do your taxes, blah, blah, blah. And then I bought it and, and it was, it was bad, but you uh -huh. know, I, I paid for it. Right. But like having the ability to, to think, okay, I, if I have to build all of this myself, it's going to take me so much time and it's going to require such a notion expertise that I don't have right now that I want to import this thing. Gotcha. Okay. Do you remember where you bought the template from by any chance? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, one second. I can, I can give it to you in a oh, minute. Yeah. I'll, I'll you can it. put it in the chat too. Yeah, just, yeah. just out of curiosity. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate it. It's actually really helpful. Johnny, you wanted to say something. Yeah, right? sure. So I the templates got mentioned just before, and I think for me, templates were one of the things that really pulled me in, the ready-made templates that other people did. But I remember when I started to create my own templates, I was very, very lost. So that is probably one of the parts where I had to check articles online how to do it. It was not as intuitive as the rest of the system, how to save it and what happens when I create a new template. So I think that is what for me would have needed a little more clarification to create my own templates. Totally fair. I remember when I, I honestly, like when I joined the company, I, I'd done some notion, but I wasn't like a super user. And like, I, I have like such an imposter syndrome because I'm always working with like the smartest people with, with, with in Notion and you know, there are power users. And mm -hmm. I feel like I'm always learning. But I remember when I first created my first template. Yeah, it was, it was weird. It's kind of like a, it's kind of a process. You'd think it'd be a lot easier. So that's, that's really helpful feedback as well. Thank you. For me, for instance, I find it a little bit frustrating when I, I always try to like, one of my main problems is that I try to build like really complex shit on Notion. I was like, yeah. that's, that's that specific thing that it's not yet there. You yeah. find it way too late into the building process, right? It's like, oh, uh, I'm already committed, yeah. right? But you don't have these recurring tasks. It's like, oh, right. <laughs> Recur know, yeah. Template. yeah, something like that. I mean, I'm just yeah. I'm totally made it up now because I haven't used it for like uh, half a year at least. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you just build everything and there's like, there's this really painful thing that's just not there, uh, which I guess it's the problem with uh, most of the all-in-one solu uh, sort right. solutions, right? But uh, but I think it's there. And then kind of like the workarounds are pretty, uh, I found them to be pretty, pretty painful. It's kind of like with Airtable, I had the same problem. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. you go there, through there, you migrate everything, uh, you, you create everything like Jen mentioned, and then all of a sudden there's this, this thing, oh no, you can't do it right now. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and it's a reoccurring task, right? It's not like you're trying to get like an HTML exploder. You're just literally something basic, yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. And then, but that's also part of my problem that I try to be like, man, per perhaps I try to build like so much comp or I have too high expectations for something that's like, you know, I know it's not a task manager, but you want to It'd be cool. manage yeah. tasks. Yeah. I mean, same problem yeah. with Basecamp essentially. So, but yeah. that's my main problem with not yeah. that there's something super, super big. 
Um, and, and you haven't album, you haven't yeah, um, sure. you haven't used it in, in in a while, or you still use it now, or how are you with Notion right now? I've got some side projects that we use Notion for. I mean, we didn't use it okay. we didn't use it in the company because we uh -huh. were committed to Basecamp, for instance, for the gotcha. all-in-one solution, central point of truth, whatnot. But I do have some other side projects and like podcasting and 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 the organization of some events and festivals that we're using Notion for. Yeah, and so that's why I don't have to keep up with all of that because I'm not the administrator of it. But sometimes, like, hey, Alex, can you do this? I like, go there. It's like, ah, <laughs> you know, yeah, also changes yeah. very rapidly. Changes very rapidly. Yeah, yeah. We're we're trying. We're trying really hard because there's a lot of different things that we just haven't gotten right. So we're trying to move fast because people are moving fast. Coda, for example, is moving very quickly. There's a bunch of other all-in-one tools that have come out, and frankly, like some of them, like we look at them and we can't even tell the difference. There's they're just you know the copycat stuff, but. It's good because it makes us, you know, move quickly. But thank you so much. That is really helpful as well. And recurring tasks, we need it. We really need it. Uh, Baptiste, you might want to go next. Yeah, just a short and funny story about how we started to use Notion. So about 10, month, 10 to 11 months ago, we uh, uh, hired a lead developer. And uh, we were at the, at the final steps of the, the, hiring, the hiring process. And he asked... He asked for the tool we were using to, uh, to handle the product roadmap. And we said we are using Asana. And he was like, OK, I'm going to take the job if you guys switch everything to Notion. And this, is, this was how this, this was that simple. We started to use Notion because we wanted this guy. And we were also willing to try the, the tool. And, and we switched everything, fr everything from Asana to Notion in one day. And he, uh, uh, he's still in the company. And we're getting along pretty, pretty well with him. That was pretty wow. aggressive, though. Yeah. That was pretty aggressive. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was, you know, the condition maybe was a bit flexible, but uh, we were uh, willing to change, uh, to switch from Asana to another tool. So we said yes, and, wow. and, and you know, it was pretty, pretty Rebe smooth. Rebecca, maybe for your co-founder, for your technical co-founder you're looking for, you can tell them, hey, you will get to m move and migrate everything to Notion if you want to. <laughs> there you go. We move very <laughs> fast here. Very, very fast. <laughs> the golden question now is, Baptiste, how do you handle the recurring tasks in Notion? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not a, a Notion power user, to be honest. Uh, I did a couple of automation, but recurring tasks can really, not, really, really not good. So I don't handle yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, there's formulas, right? But it's always like, you know, it's just a whole other step that, like, for, for it to create. Um, Red Gregory has some really good ones that I've seen. Um, Here's a here's a pretty solid guide. I'm not telling you like this is a solution, but it, it should be simpler. And like we know, we, we know, we know it, and like we're working on it. Um, but but Pete, thank you so much for sharing. That's really really cool. It's really interesting use case too. That's amazing. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, that's, that's I want to ask um, Francisco yeah. for those of, of of us that are a bit lazy with Notion. What are the best templates that we should aim to, to duplicate or borrow from? Um, man, it really depends on what you're trying to do. I feel like there's there's a bit of a movement to try to like monetize more templates i'm seeing a lot less free ones come out recently just because like people are making money i mean i'm getting on calls with folks that are making twenty thousand dollars a month like selling templates you know and like wow. kind of just like uh putting them out we had one uh there's this person that basically he ran a consulting firm um to make business more efficient and they use a lot of no code no code tools because they realized that it, you know, if they taught a restaurant or they taught a small startup how to use the tool properly, they could kind of run it on their own and continue doing it on their own. But if they made a website for them, they'd have to be the ones to maintain it and they didn't want to have that. So they were doing consulting and Notion became such a cornerstone of their business model that they spun out Notion like consulting as a, as a separate entity. And they made $50,000 in the first month, which was or the first two months, which is insane, right? So like, we're seeing this explosive use of, of, of these templates. I think people are catching on. But um, let me see here. I'm going to send you a list. I have a list. There's one of our ambassadors created this like massive list of like really useful templates. Um, they kind of check out. Red Gregory has an amazing kind of um, uh, depository of, of, of really good templates. And she like does like almost daily updates either across like Instagram, Twitter or something. So I would definitely recommend her um and thomas frank has some pretty solid ones too um and they tend to be all free too um but yeah um i'm gonna i'm gonna have to follow up with y'all a little bit um after to see um what i can send over but let me know what you're looking for and like i see so many of these things every day that I can probably point you in the right direction 
All righty. I think that's that. That was a good a good point. Uh, um, to wrap it up, actually, we've been here for an hour and a half, so it's really surprised and thankful for you know everybody just popping by and asking and sharing because we've shared a lot. We share uh, very important things regarding IP, how to hire developers, technical co-founders, CTOs, how to use Notion, how to manage distribution for alcoholic brands, and uh, like a lot, a lot of stuff. Funnily enough, a friend of mine is stalking the event and just found out that, Jan, you're working at fool.com. He asked, what stonks should we buy? <laughs> There's a... Come on. Come on. This is, this, is, this, is advice. this is financial advice. So, therefore, it's you will go to Legal jail. financial advice. Legal, legal, legal that, financial. It's the one thing that will get me fired. I would point you to the, to the product right. that has been successful for, for 20 years that you can sign up for a Yeah. Years a year that does recommend those those stocks um Stunks. yeah i don't want to get into trouble <laughs> <laughs> so, i have, I have too bad of, uh, <laughs> especially because you, you're you're pressing the record button it's not recorded uh, okay it's recorded it's rec this is re yeah, still okay. being recorded so you know yeah it's okay uh, we're just gonna put it on reddit it's fine I'm a great yeah we'll put it on hacker news and reddit so no worries and wall street bets <laughs> Um, <laughs> that anyways, all right. Uh, if you want one, one advice, I would say, um, for anyone who wants to make money for, for stonks, the whole philosophy of Motley Fool is put your it's money there good. and don't touch it. Like don't, don't day trade, don't Joseph Akram, don't bullshit. Just mm -hmm. find solid companies, leave it for five years, 10 years, 20 years, continue to work, which is what will give you the biggest value. And then whenever you, you, you need that money, or if you want to use it for something else, go, go and use it. I think that that's a. I think it, it's interesting that the best performing, uh, I won't say company, but fund, however you want to call it, set of companies on the SP500 is not doing something crazy. It's just, you know, finding good companies and leaving it there for a lot of years. So, yeah. I'm a, I'm a huge follower of fool.com, the Motley Fool. So I can wholeheartedly recommend what Dan said. And I've uh, been doing it for a year only. So, of course, this is not financial advice. And if it is, you got you got a lot of problems if you're trusting me. So you know the problem's yours, not mine. Anyways, uh, I think we can wrap it up here. Thank we thank you everybody for contributing. Thank you everybody for being so supportive of Star Grind Barcelona. Been rocking for seven years and a half. If all things go well, the next event will be in person, and we have the rockstar oh, wow. here. We have Rebecca who will be the speaker in our next event. We'll be talking about her experience as a founder of Invertis in the prop tech market in Barcelona, bootstrapping, bootstrapping her business. How how she worked with an agency, how she uh, like how she found the product market fit and whatnot. So um, we're going to announce it or publish it um, any day from now. So um, if all things go well, we'll be able to meet in person for the first time in 18 months. So cool. let's make it happen. And of course, uh, all following the strictest regulations uh, with uh, freaking COVID and whatnot, but uh, it will be in a rooftop. It will be in an open networking area. So, you know, safety distance and more. So, all righty, I think we can wrap it up here. Thank you very much, everybody. And hope you have a, a nice week. Any contact, just if you want me to connect to anybody in the in the room and you can find their contact details in the chat, send me an email, I'll make the best possible. Otherwise, you can find us in this Slack community that we've got for Startup Rank in Barcelona and other entrepreneurs from other communities. It's open for all the communities in Barcelona. It's free to join. We got, I don't know how many, like over a thousand people over there. So feel free to check it out and we can continue the conversation there. Goodbye, everybody.